Alright. Let me just get this a little bit closer for you all for the audio purposes of today. In fact, yeah, let's get a little, a little more camera love there. Alright, everybody. How are we? How's another Friday? Doing good, Alex. Hanging in there. Just moving along. And June is moving along, right? I can't believe how fast weeks go now in life. It's crazy. Wish I could speak to myself as a child and go, just enjoy it. What's up, Mr. Dice Gang? In again? Th thanks for being in here. All right, so I know the video's fine. Uh, sounds like the audio is good. So give me a thumbs up. Um... I don't want to turn on audio on my computer, but I can see the video's good. Making sure before I start rolling into the discussion for today. Um, okay, good. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for letting me know. Things are good. How are things for you? Hope all is well. Um, so we're going to do another session here. Uh, starting from a sphere. So... Uh, Varon, you're new to ZBrush, and you're talking about what you, what are you looking at from starting from a sphere? I'm going to be covering like topics and questions. I'm not going to be doing a sculpt from beginning to end. I'm going to be taking questions, and then I'm taking questions that you as the users have already asked us. So we have a segment called um, hashtag Ask ZBrush. So you can ask a question on Twitter. And then if you put the hashtag ask ZBrush, we can search for those questions. And then I pluck those questions out every week. And then I'm answering them in the streams. So that's a great way for you to learn and then come back to the stream. And then obviously we're live. So you can ask me whatever you want. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to go from there. But I can give you some pointers, which is would probably be good for you. Um, since you're new and you're saying asking going from a, a sphere. Um, uh, Stetzer plays again. I'm not sculpting anything from beginning to end. I'm actually taking questions and answering questions that have already been sent into us. I'm not sculpting any one piece from beginning to end in this stream. It's going to be really an open, you far away some questions, and I'm going to take them as they come in. And like I said, I already have stuff planned out from what you've all have already sent in to me. All right, so f as far as what you were asking about from a sphere, let's let's this is a great question. I think. The beginning of a sculpt is so important. I, I, For me, I think it's one of the most important steps and the most important. That first 20% of your sculpt is really bringing everything to life. And you can be, we can be amazing at adding, finding alphas and putting skin pores and cracks and wrinkles, things like this. But that's not, not really going to do anything if you don't have the beginning foundation set up. Okay. Hi, Lincoln from Zimbabwe. Wow. Thanks for tuning in. Wow. So, <clears throat> hi, Mala. Okay, so from a sphere is where I would normally start with a head. If I'm going to sculpt a head, then a sphere is my choice. If I'm going to start, say, like a robot, I'll tend to start from a cube. It's just, it's hard surface. It's more robotic, things like that. Okay? Okay? <clears throat> So, uh, as far as what you're asking about a search for ZBrush Face Beginner Series, uh, I'm not sure, but there probably is some streams that we can find where people, there's a lot of streams where people are starting from nothing. Uh, you know, like Ashley Adams starts from nothing. You probably want to watch her streams on this channel. Um, Shane Olson would be another one to watch on this channel. Um, I know Luca has also been doing stuff from scratch. A lot of the streamers on our channel are bu building something from scratch, too. So not all of them. Some are doing different things. So there's a lot on this channel. At Dice K, if you want to find anything, I'd appreciate it for them. But let me just go with what you were asking in essence, okay? So number one, the beginning part is I tend to start with a sphere if I'm doing a head, like what we're talking about now. And I will use Dynamesh, which is obviously the feature. This feature is really meant for this. It's meant... Two, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm going to do some kind of character, and I'm not quite sure where you're going with this. So obviously, references are going to be huge for you, right? I've got a ton of books. i got a ton of things I use for reference. I've sculpted a lot of heads now, so I kind of 
can block out ahead relatively fast for me. I'm going to say the one thing I give all when I teach beginner users, period, to beginner users to sculpting. And also, obviously, at that time, they're usually probably beginning users even to something like ZBrush. Okay. So this is a practice that I like to give, and it's sculpting a skull. And you can do it pretty much with two brushes, three if you throw in the smoothing brush. Right. <clears throat> so for me, this is huge because then also when you're making a character and you'll see, oh, we'll do something really fast right now. When you get that, that skull formed down, it's automatically going to put things correct where you need it. Right. And I would use something like, let me grab something for you. Like referencing, obviously, right? And you can bring in images, and I'll show you images that you can bring in. This is getting washed out. There you go. Right? So, and this is like on a, a a bar, so I can turn it. I can look at it. And this is an actual skull scan done by Anatomy Tools. Right? So, if I'm doing a skull, I'm going to have something like that there as a reference. Now, you can bring images in. But first, let me just get to the point here of taking this. So number one, I'm going to use the move brush. Okay. This is going to be all about like if I had, this is a ball of clay. It's about using all my hand. Like I'm using both hands to grab on this clay. So you got to start thinking about bone structure, I think is really important here. So this is what I mean by why I also give my first lesson to new, to new people is a skull. Because then you're just really focused on bone structure. You're not so focused on, oh, I'm going to make the most amazing eyelids. Like none of that, right? I want to just focus on. And then you start learning things, which is by going to, what it's going to do is make things pop correctly. I.e. stuff like the toppest part of the human skull is actually back here, right? It's not here and by our foreheads and everything. It's way back here. It's way back here, right? So knowing that, I always make a habit of making like a higher peak right there on purpose because I know I'm going to smooth it back. I want that little bit of ramp coming from the forehead up to that back of that head. So that's one important bony landmark for me when I'm going to start sculpting a person. The next bone that's really important to me is the zygomatic or zygomatic arch. It's going to establish that's this, your cheekbone, if we want to just keep it terminology simple, okay? Okay. So this right here, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is this is where I'll switch to clay buildup. So this is going to establish where your eye starts sitting, your orbital bone, right? It's gonna establish where your nose should go, right? So in essence, then I know that the nose is about halfway between, right, our faces, okay? So then I look at the side and I start I start sculpting this. Let me actually reset my brushes. I was playing with all my brushes in another meeting. There we go. So I start establishing that bony landmark, right? And it doesn't go straight across. So like if I'm looking like at this, there is some other movement happening in here, right? So it'll come across. And then from the front, I like to kind of start making a triangle right here for that part, this part of our bone. You can all touch it right here. I'm at this part right here. Right, so it comes across, and then it kind of makes a structure like this, and this is in essence the cheekbone, right? This starts establishing that bony landmark, and then I dig it in a little bit more, and that automatically is going to start establishing your jaw, or I.e. the mandible, is what we would call it, right? And then that mandible doesn't go any further, right, than the ear, which then back to this bone, this idea, this is where your ear canal is for an ear, right? So this is why for me, this bone is so important. So if anything out of this conversation we're having here, the number one thing I would say take away from it, if you can establish the right cheekbone, i.e. zygomatic, zygomatic arch. So this is the arch, this is zygomatic because muscles are going through there for us. That's how we bite down, right? The actual masseter muscles up here connecting to the jaw. And then the one thing I always remember is muscles can only pull. They can't push. Muscles only pull. So that means there's an origin and insertion point, right? So the origin of our jaw muscle, the close bite down, is up here and it's connecting here. So you got to think about stuff like that. That's why if you guys, unlike me with my crazy hair, if you're like doing something like this, 
you'll notice all this area up here is moving on you. Right? So these kind of little things, like I don't think you need to know everything. I don't know everything about anatomy. Heck, no. Okay? But if you understand an artistic mindset of anatomy, okay, you'll be able to go a lot further. So this is why this bone is so important to me. It's lining up where my ear is going to go. It's lining up where I'm going to start putting in an orbitable bone, right? Or in essence, where our eye socket is, right? This is where I'm going to start. And the other thing I would say also keep in mind with bone, especially your orbital bone, they almost are, we're almost crying. Like if you look at it, we kind of got like a sadness in here. So you see how this is going up right now? That's not the better way to do it. It's better to actually sculpt like this. It's, look how different, see? Just that? is already starting to look a little bit like a skull, right? Compared to if I went the other direction, right? That's looking more like an alien maybe or my own creation. If I'm going to try and go the human route, then these little things is what sets you off to make a good looking skull and a realistic character. This is what I mean by the first 20% is so important. So just that simple thing of the orbital bone going the right direction is going to make or break, does it start looking human or does it start looking more like a creation that I'm coming up with, right? So then I start establishing these bones and going, okay, so the zygomatic or arch here and then this, this needs to be room in here for a muscle, right? Stuff like this, okay? And then there's bony right in here, right? Because this the whole point of this is protecting our eye. Like if you're get punched from here and needs to protect. So we need to establish that protection, right, for our eye. And these little things, is as you can see, these are small things, but this is starting to pop a little bit to start looking like an actual human skull. And I'm not doing anything crazy right now. I'm just landing things and then going at it, right? And then the key thing here is, I would say as an artist, for me that I'm, I'm constantly learning. I have so far to go in my art journey for me, honestly. You know, I've been doing art for a long time, but you know, it's so far. And then, you know, now that I have a kid and watching her do art just blows my mind. She's already doing shading and stuff on drawings at five years old for a class she's taking, it's insane. So you start looking at everything. You gotta move around, okay? You got to start moving around the model quickly. Don't just sit here and go, I'm going to make this. Yes, this is going to be an orbital bone, right? Yes. Just start blocking it out. Get the general shape and start moving things around and start landing and moving. Like So like I said, there's got to be a bony landmark right here for our mandible in our cheekbone, right? And then this is, in essence, doing something more like this, right? And then... This is where our teeth are going to come into play, i.e. the mouth. So there needs to be some volume in here. We definitely need some volume. What I mean by volume from this view looking like that, right? So just giving me some ability to have some of that volume in there, right? Because then our nose is going to start popping off. Okay, and it's just a quick, 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 right? And then start putting in now. I got to be able to, he's got to be able to breathe, he or she, right? They got to be able to breathe. So I need sinuses, okay? And then this is one of the big things I think where people make mistakes too when you're starting to sculpt up like a humanoid looking character is <clears throat> this part stays too flat in the front, right? So there's a thing called draft, right, in our face. And that's if you guys take your hand and they're flat, right? You got them flat. And then just push them to your face you're gonna see you'll make like a V shape a little bit, right? So obviously it's a little more U in real life. So that's that that angle there that we want, that draft is what's important to me. And the nose, you know, our bone for our nose doesn't sit like this, it comes off the surface. So there needs to be this part of the skull in this case, or face to come off. I need that, I need to start having this Right, and then I'll switch to a move brush too and really start to maybe hone that in a little bit more and start just, and you see, I'm not getting too crazy right now. I'm not too worried. And that's the other big thing I'd have to say sculpturally. Don't get too consumed of, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look real. 
that's not what I'm concerned about. There's a nice, again, more bone structure here. And again, there's a reason for that on the human face. It is protecting something. It's protecting our eyes. Our eyes are valuable. valuable. We only get the two. That's it. There's no replacing them, right? So I need to make sure this bone structure here is right. And then coming in here, and then I'm looking at this. Again, here's another little V shape in here. Just like there's this V shape here, okay? So there's a little V shape in here as well that I wanna make sure I hit that. Just gives that little bone structure now that we're getting, okay? And then now, again, it's just quickly moving around and going like this, right? This needs to be pushed back. This is not correct. Okay, and then the beauty of Dynamesh, we hold control, we click and drag, and then bam, we get more clay. Okay? So this is obviously, this is where my ear placement is going to go. None of this. This is really going to be the jaw or mandible. It shouldn't be way back here. Right? So then this is where maybe, you know, it'll be easier for me to move. Now, here's something. This is a, look up here. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Right? Kind of moment. For those that never watched my stream, welcome to the craziness that it is my streams. So this brush, right, move is nice. But in this scenario, I need a cross, okay, the whole thing here to work. I want all this to move. So this is a prime example, okay, of using a completely different moving brush, right? This is where I would move to the move infinite depth. And I'll come back to some great books for you. I'll, I'll, I'll show some to you again. Right, so the move infinite depth, okay, is looking at screen space right now. So however the model's facing the camera, I can then when I do this, all of it's moving. Right, so across this whole thing here, all of this mesh is moving at a consistent pace. This is important, and I like to call kind of when I talk to people, trying to not muck up the sculpt or dirty the sculpt in essence. Um, so what I mean by that is. If you notice, I'm staying pretty low, right, while I'm working, and then I'm doing a little bit of smoothing, right? That's what I mean by mucking up the sculpt. I would highly recommend you build a little surface up and then smooth it back a little bit so you don't get in the, the rhythm of having something that looks like blobby sculpting, like a little bumpy, okay? Everything's good, Mr. Chris. Thanks for coming in. Wait a minute again, that lets you move around. Okay. Um, the way I like to navigate again is with the right click navigation. So obviously I'm using my stylus pen. I'm on a Cintiq. So this button here that's on the side of your, your pen and by walk on the bottom part here, that's right click, walk them or wake them, whatever you want to call the company. Okay. That's right click. So I'm just hovering. <clears throat> I'm hovering over and then I'm just right clicking that rotates. And then my cursor can be over the model. So things like this is why I prefer this workflow. So I don't have to worry about going into the highway to the safe zone. Ba, 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 ba. Right? I can just stay right here and just work away on this. Right? And so that how to do that is I'm going to hold the alt key. And you can see, look at my, uh, my little thing here I, I got for you guys down here in the corner. And then right click. So you can see alt. And you can see hold see it says i'm holding the alt key okay and then control and you can see control and right click and you see i'm still holding the control key and you'll notice i'll do this where i'm letting go of the right click a lot to go back and forth right so that's why this little thing down here for you guys is to help you out with that Okay, so you can see my mandible, like, look how tiny that is. It's too small. This is what I mean by moving around, getting those mark landing marks correct. Again, look what happens if you're not going to use the right move. So I would 100% infinite depth is a great brush to use when you're going to be building something like this, right? Look at a reference. Uh, mandible should have a little bit of an angle right here leading up to the ear, right? Let's smooth it down if you have to. Really get that angle that you want in there right get this out there's nothing wrong with moving this around this is another reason why i am trying to keep this at a very low low polygon count i am never at this stage going really high 
right? And then so now my mandible is really, really narrow right now. Way too narrow, right? So then this is where, okay, the mandible needs to come out more. Okay, and then here's another thing what I like about the zygomatic, the zygo bone or zygomatic arch as well, okay? As far as a human skull goes, and again, we're talking human skull, there are certain things that you should not go past. Don't go into that light. Don't go into that forest. Sure, it's forest. It's haunted. Okay? This part of our human skull, nothing sticks out further than this bone. This, again, going back to that, this is why I love this bone. This bone establishes so much for me in the human face. It's crazy. It's establishing the midpoint where my nose, see, look, you draw a line, boom, you hit your nose. Go back, boom, you hit your ear. So now I know where my nose and my ear land. Boom, this is the bottom of where the eye starts to come into play. And then the orbital bone comes around back to the eye. And you can see mine's off a little bit right now. Right? I definitely I definitely don't like what's going on with mine. Okay? So I'm going to change this up a little bit in here. Right? I got to put a little bit more of... It's angry now. Ugh. Right? But it's actually right. You want to have a little bit of some sadness in there. Okay, like you can see, I'm going to do this without, if I wasn't talking to you guys, I'd just be working real fast, going around and looking at different views, making sure this is landing correct. I'm not worried about teeth. I'm not worrying about muscles. I'm just worrying about, do I have the bone structure quite right yet? Like, is it where it should be? Like this needs to be a little bit adjusted still, right? This kind of stuff that might be now a little too extreme. I think that's way too extreme. It should be out here a little bit more, all right? should be out here so I'm gonna build this surface back up some more right and then I'm just going through and looking at this right and all this is to help me land the rest of when I start sculpting the rest of the human again highest peaking points up here if you have to make a little point right there for yourself right come here and make a little point right there so you know that's your high point if you have to do something like that okay and then now you will put a little bit if you want to, just for your sake, getting a little bit of that bone structure in here. I don't normally do something crazy like this, but it'll help with the neck placement, I think. Um, and then the back of the skull, you know, the ear canal has a little part of the skull for us that's doing this. And then I need some more buildup back here. I need some more volume in my skull through here. And you can see this is all I do. I just quickly start putting some volume. I take a step back. I look and see if I'm getting the right approach here, okay? And this is obviously going to need to be pushed back a little bit. Okay, something more like that. <clears throat> so actually, you know, I'm getting a little more heroic with my guy. Yes, I'm heroic. So now the bones, as far as books, one of the best books 100% you should have if you want to learn anatomy <clears throat> is this book. Like everyone should have this book if you're going to learn anatomy, okay, and you want to sculpt. This is by Elliot Goldfinger. This is called The Human Anatomy for Artists. I can't tell you how much, because it's an amazing book. He shows images of faces. He shows where the bones and where the muscles are landing. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I mean by the first 20% of sculpting, right, <clears throat> is really landing that, okay? And this is the point of Dynamesh. The point of Dynamesh was, I want to go at this. I want to work on this. So to me, that's a fantastic book. There's a couple other books, too, that were made by people that they use ZBrush to make the anatomy. There's facial anatomy for sculptors. I don't have it here in this office. Let me double check. Uh, I think I checked last time. but Yeah, I think it's my other office. Um, another, Honestly, another great way is look at an artist that does clay. Like does actual, they don't they do not do digital as much. They're really a clay artist. Um, so one of my favorite here, Felipe Ferro is amazing. Um, yeah. So this is a great book as well. So Felipe Ferro, he's in New York, Troy, New York area. He does workshops. So I really want to take one of his workshops when the pandemic finally comes to its end, right? But he's all clay. But he's, he's I, I've had conversations with him. Like 90% of his people he's training, they're ZBrush users. 
right? But he does a great job in clay form breaking. Like just that, okay, is good to go. Um, I tend to not use Sculptors Pro as much because I like to keep at this stage, I like to keep my detailing relatively low because I don't want to get trapped in the hole of, oh no, I, I, for me, I think it's a mistake when I start putting too much detail because then I get trapped in that. And then I'm looking at the details too much instead of just looking at what's wrong with the sculpt. Um, but Sculptors Pro would be nice for sure to do this, but I don't like this for me. I don't want these strokes to be that strong at this stage specifically. So I wouldn't use Sculptors Pro until I get further along, a little bit more further along for myself, right? But I know a lot of artists now that are just using Sculptors Pro doing the same thing I'm doing, and they're just using Sculptures Pro to do it, right? <laughs> so it all, it comes, I think, personal preference. It's all personal preference, in my opinion. There's so many ways you guys can attack this. I was just answering the question and someone asked, starting from a sphere, how would you go about it, right? And now that person asked, how do you start adding a neck and things like this? There's so many ways, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, quick question when exporting, how should I prep the ring? Uh, you would have to do all that in that application. Um, there's Z remeshing ability, but that which could work, but it's not made for animation. You would need to make animation ready meshes. Okay, so now that I start doing this, this is where I'll start landing um, a neck, right? And then I want to start building a torso. So for me, for me, this is what I like to do. Okay, I like to work a certain way. Like, see, I can see from this view, this is sticking out way too far. That's way, that's way too far. That, that bone arch is sticking way too far out, right? See there, that's a lot better. And then now this, whoops, this is sticking out way too far. See, look, see, just, this is what I'm saying. Move around a lot. Go from different views. You have digital, take advantage of it, right? This is what I, we didn't have when we're doing... Excuse me, clay. I don't have, it's not this easy to just flip the head upside down in clay world and then look at it and find that your proportions are off a little bit. Like, you, we don't have that advantage. So take advantage of this, right? As much as you can. I, I definitely need a little bit more forehead, right? All this, right? And then you can see, you'll get to the point where you start learning more about the anatomy, right? This part of the head from the front view, the back of the head back here sticks out the furthest okay so hey from india how are you so this kind of stuff so you can see in this session that's a skull that's starting to become a skull you can't say that it's not becoming a skull okay so the important parts is let me first now get to the neck and putting a torso on and then let me show you the next phase of things i like to set up for myself okay so when i'm like okay i've got a i've got a pretty good sculpt going now i've got something that's working for me and it's giving me what I'm looking for, okay, in this skull. I've got pretty much what I want. And now I want to start establishing also the rest of the body. I think that's crucial too. So for me, <clears throat> there's multiple ways that you guys can go about this. There is now the new way, of course. Well, it's not really new, but there's the new brush, which we have chisel shapes in here, right? <clears throat> so there are some shapes in here. So a neck is pretty much a cylinder. So there is a cylinder shape right here that I can just start pulling out a cylinder, right? And to that person's question about Sculptures Pro, this is where you might want to turn Sculptures Pro on. I go with a little bit smaller brush size so that when I'm pulling out on this cylinder, right, it's adding a little bit of form. But if you pull too much, it can see the other side, right? So this is a, a way to go about establishing a neck, right? That's establishing my neck piece. I personally, like to do this, okay? So my preferred method is this. I like to turn on the groups option in Dynamesh, okay? And then I like to start just copying this shape. Boom, I've got two skull things happening here now. Okay, so hold control, click on the arrow while you're holding control. Again, watch my shortcuts over here, right? Holding control. Clicking on the arrow, dragging it down. And then now I'm going to say, well, okay, again, a cylinder shape. Perfect. I'm going to click on the gear, and here's some shapes right here. So there's my cylinder. Boom, there's my cylinder. Okay, it's pretty tiny. Let's make it bigger. 
it's not facing the right direction. And then a neck isn't perfectly like straight. I'm gonna put a little bit of an angle on this, size it up a little bit more, right? So you see all this flow that I have, putting a little bit more volume in that and should sit back here probably more. This is why it's so important establishing like my mandible's still off, right? And you'll see this stuff when you start, this is why I say I start putting things into play because you'll start catching things more. I'm like, my mandible's still off for sure. All right, and then doing this, okay? And then when I go and re-dynamesh by holding control and pulling, you'll see that this polygroup is maintained, which is really nice, okay, having this, but that's not all that's maintained. What's maintained is this never fused with the skull. So it's still its own piece. I prefer working in this kind of a structure. Okay, I just prefer this because then this allows me to say, okay, I wanna work on just the neck and get the neck to be a little bit different. So I wanna mask everything else. So I can hold control when I'm in the gizmo and tap on the green. And now the red is masked. And this is gonna be important because I'm gonna start pulling in more items here. And then I just start establishing more of a neck for the guy and again have that Elliot Goldfinger book out whatever you're going to use as a reference you got to have a reference you got to have a reference here's another good thing All right this is another anatomy tools thing any many 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 zebra artists have one of these he hand sculpted this Andrew but this is probably one of the best anatomy pieces to look at as well for reference so establishing that neck just get that neck and see there's got to be a little bit of an angle to the neck, right? These little things make the difference. That's what's going to make the sculpt look more realistic. It's not, I'm going to go grab an amazing texture and make it have um, amazing like skin pores. It doesn't matter. The first thing any artist is going to notice when they're looking at your artwork is, are the proportions right? Is the arms too long? The, what, what's off? What's not working right? That's, that's what we're going to notice first as an, an artistic eye like all of us, right? And then now that I have this, I'm going to say, okay, there's, I'm establishing my neck. Let's establish a ridge, rib cage, okay? I can now even do this, copy the whole thing again, right? You'll notice that the head and the neck are masked out. I'm going to now say, all right, let's put this at the center. Let's make sure the gizmo is sitting at the center of this, okay? Because that's important to me. Then I'm going to click on this. And for me, it makes sense to use a spherical shape, right? And then now I just size this up, position this a little bit more where I would have a torso, okay? And then again, remesh that, right? And then now I'm re meshing and I got groups on. So this shape, this shape here is not connected to the neck. Why is this important and valuable? Because this is going to make things like this easier. I can edit just the ribcage portion now of this model, right? And then now, because this is a separate piece, this is a separate piece, this is a separate piece, I can even take advantage now of using a different move brush. And this is a move brush that I'll use in this scenario. What's your question that you're asking? Is there a brush that can uniformly dis, uh, distribute edges of a plane? You mean you're just trying to insert multiple edge loops? Is that all you're trying to do? Or are you trying to move multiple edge loops? What exactly is it you're trying to do? Okay, so me, I move topological. I can go with a massive brush size and see nothing's masked. And I can now just start reshaping. And because this shape is not welded with the top shapes, I can sit here and start mapping out a rib cage, right? And again, you see what I'm what I'm talking about? Doing simple, simple, simple bone structure. Everybody, it's going to take your sculpt so much further. Don't try to get right into it. I'm just going to throw arms on this. Make a rib cage. Like get it to look like an actual rib cage, right? Get that general shape. You know, this this rib right here is really important. It's that tenth rib, right? And then the Rib cage wouldn't be doing that. It'd be more like this. Right? This, I'm telling you right now, if you embrace this idea of just getting the bone structure somewhat correct, you're going to see things just happen and pop, right? And then this is my process. This is this is how I start going at this, right? And then, and then I can even use an insert mesh brush and I can say sphere and then 
drag out a sphere and then adjust this. Put this where I want to be to maybe start representing a shoulder joint, right? And then when I read Dynamesh, I know this is not welding with the rib cage part right now, right? And then this is my process that I'll start to go through. And then having everything separate is nice. So now back to the face real quick. And I want to show something uh, which is actually one of the questions today is what does the dot do in the Dynamesh resolution? What's this little dot over here do? This is going to be important actually for what we're doing as well. It's going to be quite important. All right. So this is one of the questions that came up. So <clears throat> what I'm going to want to start doing now is start putting things. Like if you notice, if you put this correct in the correct location, now you want to put a nose. All you're doing for a nose is filling in this cavity. And if you land this right, you're going to, right out the gate, just a couple strokes, you're going to start having a nose come off the face. See? It's that simple, right? It's Well, it's not simple, but you can see by landing things correctly, you start having an easier time and making things come to life, right? So now there's also the ability, if I smooth this out a little bit, we now have also, well, we, we've had the ability to just go grab one of these brushes that already have noses, right? So if I got this right, I should be able to put a nose right here, right? It's beautiful, beautiful nose. Okay, but what I wanna do is also establish some eyes so I'm going to put some eyeballs in here. And what's important about the eyes is also the placement. There should be the eye, the front of the iris or the eye should not cross the plane, this plane right here. So if I, if I take this brush so you guys can visually this right there, that line right there, that eyeball should not cross that line, right? Cause then it'd be popping out of their eye socket. If that's where my eye socket is going to be where this zygomatic is, right? And then the orbital bone up here in the top, if you put your hand across there, you'll notice your eye is gonna butt right up into your hand, right? Just do this, right? Your hand's gonna be on an angle. It's not straight. It's not gonna be straight. It's gonna be on a little bit of an angle, right? It's not extreme, but it's a little bit of an angle. And then the eyeball should never cross that angle. That is, again, a simple artistic thing that's gonna help you land things correctly. Okay, and then now again, I'm going to go back to the move topological. And this is what I mean by why I stay really low to that question about Sculptress Pro. I'm not at that point yet because this is not right now. I need to reestablish this bone. That eyeball needs to get more protection, man. It's, it's still not being protected right. Right, so I need to reestablish. So this is why I'm putting in kind of landmarks here for me to establish this. Now. Because I have this on, this groups option on, what we're allowed to do now is have the resolution slider do different things for us now. In essence, look at the mesh a different way. Okay, so what I mean by that, let's put a bunch of small items in here. Sound effects so important. So let's just put various size spheres in here since this was the question that got thrown at us. Okay, so, and we'll go bigger too. Okay, so when I read Dynamesh, okay, you'll see the shapes that you're getting, right? You look, in, especially here and here, like see the smaller ones, and like this one, they're starting to lose a lot of their spherical shape there. Okay, and so what I could do is this dot right over here, okay, this is here for the users. I just have to, have to put it on. Okay, so if you open this dot, then the Dynamesh, when it goes to reevaluate the surface and in essence retopologize the surface on the fly, it's going to look at this very different. Okay, and so when I go and read Dynamesh now, right, you're going to get different results with an open circle compared to a closed circle. Right? So here, if we go up a little bit more and some more resolution here, let's, let's get rid of the spheres right now. Let's, let's just up the resolution a little bit more for you guys as well. So you can really see. Okay. So, oh. 
Okay, so we've got more resolution, see? And then more resolution, more resolution, because see now these are being updated because I touched them. See, this isn't being updated because it hasn't changed. So this is one thing that's nice, okay? But when you got start doing stuff like this, okay, and then you read Dynameshing, see the spherical shape that we're getting, okay? If we do that same thing, and then you have an open circle, and then you're doing this, right? Right? You'll get a different result based upon that. It's In essence, it's evaluating and looking for smaller meshes. That's what it's doing. It's looking for smaller meshes and giving more resolution to the smaller meshes. That's what it's trying to do. Okay? <clears throat> so that's, that's what the point of that open circle and closed circle is. The person that asked the question. All right? And then at any point in time in here, I'm going to start splitting stuff off. I'm going to make the eyeballs their own eyes. Right? And then there's a point where I do want to start having things weld together. So then I will select that subtool, right? This one. And then I'll turn the groups option off and then redynamish. And then now this is all welded together, right? And then now this is <clears throat> establishing now, start establishing some muscle tone in here, just quickly proportioning things. Like, see, this is for me too dense at this stage. I, again, I prefer this way down further it's just a personal preference because i want to put big strips of clay in here is what i want to do right and then start establishing where your muscling might start going in in essence all this stuff will start popping right making sure this bone right your clavicle is connected right correctly into your scapula which then the scapula comes out here right you see all this stuff I'll do a lot of quickly just mapping out this stuff. And if you map this kind of stuff out, I'm telling you, everything's just going to fall into place for you, right? And then now, obviously, this, and this is what I mean by, you know, I like to do this sometimes just so I don't get lost. And I just need a general understanding for me. And then you got to start having muscles that come up into locations and again as a artist you only need to know some general muscle forms and then obviously the muscles need to come down here and connect through here your trapezius right connecting into your scapula your delts and then it's going to lead into your delts right all this okay no malik i don't no my fr my French is gone. Okay? And then this is how I start blocking out and getting to the point. Okay? Does that make sense? To that, so that person that was asking, starting from a sphere, this is the route I'll start going. And then it's, it, then it's just a process. And again, it all will come to you the more you study, the more you sculpt. It's the old saying... The more practice you put in, obviously, the more you're go the better you're going to get at things. It's just, it's going to happen, right? I you all understand more of the muscles like this, the the delts kind of do like they go in like a C shape from the top, they wrap around like this, connecting, right? So I since the muscles do that, I tend to do this with my shoulders to make sure that, and then it's just going to start popping and give me shoulders. Right, and then if I want to change a little bit of the shape, I can change a little bit of the shape. But you can see it's starting to already establish a line right here where the delts are going to live, and then, right, your pec muscles actually connect into your arm, so that means the muscle comes down here, and it fans out. So do a fanning out, like do a fan out like this, right? And then there's more mass here. So this is, for me, the pectoral muscles are three masses. What am I doing this? Three masses. There's this, the bottom one here that's connecting into your arm. Down here, this is a mass, and this is going to establish that. The undercut here that you get in strong characters, it starts establishing that right there. And if I want to highlight that now, I switch to like a Damien Standard brush, and then I just hi I hit that a little bit more for me. So my eye, artistically can catch that a little bit better. And then now I accent that a little bit more. 
and then your sternum would be in here. You'd have a bone structure right in here. Right? It's, it's again, it's just quick, quick, quick movements to start blocking this out. Right? And then now I need, like I said, more muscle mass through here. Right? So there's got to be more mass happening in here. Right? And then the third mass is coming up into here. Right? And then what's going to do is create this hollow area right in here, which what we have, right? We have a, a spot right in here where we can stick our fingers, right? Through here, right in here, this area right here, right? We can put our finger right in there. And then right in here too, down here, there's a spot right there, right? That I can kind of grab the delt right there, right? <clears throat> That's because there's this bone clavicle and then these muscles are only going so far down the club. They're not coming all the way down here. They're only coming so far, right? And so this, if you guys start landing these bony marks, this stuff will just pop. You won't need to do kind of what I'm doing with you, trying to highlight these areas. It'll just come if you're landing things right. Okay? Does that make sense? Hey, John. It's not Thursday. Uh, yeah, time does fly, right? Okay, so there you go. So that's answering also that question is how, Dynamash, and we went in a long more questions, and then this dot is allowing the resolution to say how much of the mesh tube look at smaller versions, right? So when you're making something Dynamash, is it tinier? Is it larger? Okay. So then there you go. Right? No, no, uh, no comics legend. No, I, I have not had the time to get back to that project. Okay, so there you go. Let's let's continue moving on here because the goal of this, I want to be answering questions for you all and going out through this. So let's look at another question that came up. Okay, uh, let's help if I turn the other one on. Is there a way to create uniform hair cards for games? Okay, so there is a way to do this for sure. So this person was looking for something where they wanted really just a uniformal shape first of hair cards. And then they would start, re, you know, moving around themselves and then adding a couple other here and there where they wanted them. So there's definitely a, a, a way to do this. Okay, and I'm going to combine the ability to, with one click, get a uniformal kind of hair with hair cards and then also you adding your own hair cards in places that you want to add them okay so let's switch to a new different model now all right so let's switch to this girl <clears throat> all right so if i'm doing hair right i want hair to be obviously in certain locations here and then just like all of us are right, we've got different length hair the hair up here on the top okay and then that's longer than the hair here. And then sort of the hair on my back isn't as long as the hair here. So that you're going to need different size hair cards. So thinking about that, I'm going to mask out the area first of where I would think there'd be a little bit for her, some longer hair. Okay, I'd, so I'd say majority of this area, I would have longer hair coming through this area of the model. Just doing a quick mesh. Now, if you want to, it wouldn't hurt to divide up maybe one so then you just get a little bit more control your mask maybe two at most like i probably wouldn't go any higher than this like this is this is enough i don't need crazy line here like ridiculous amount of detailing here okay i just need this right just to get a little bit more control of where i want that masking to go and we'll come across her head, because I'm also going to use other things to put in hair here and all that, right? So I established say, something like this, just a quick mask. And then now for me to do something very quick for hair cards, I'm actually going to use fiber mesh. Okay. So if you hit preview, you're going to get hair. What? Well, it looks like hair, right? So we're trying to do something that's more in the gaming idea world of things. OK, 
Okay, uh, let's go ahead and change the color now just of this so you guys can visually see this a little better. So I'm gonna change this black to like a brighter color and change the tip to a brighter color, right? And you can see you can change the hair color, but let's just, for the sake of just visually for you all to be able to see, there, that looks better, right? So right now, what's happening is I'm getting 50,000 strands of hair or fibers, right? And that's way too many, number one. Right? So this max fiber slider here, I'm going to knock this way down. I'm going to even just put it at one for now. Okay? And I got, hold on. I got to move this. I need to be able to get to my keyboard and hit enter. Okay? So I want this to have a max fiber. Hold on. I accidentally don't got rid of my mask. There we go. Okay, so this, I want a max number. So now it just looks like he, she's got a real problem. Okay, real problem. Some thinning problem here. Okay, so I'm going to hide my mask by hitting Control H. So the mask is still there, but that helps me just see the hair a little bit better. Okay, so at least now I've got less, which would be good. The second thing that becomes important for me, especially with the question that came in for gaming, for hair cards, right now, the width, it's like straws coming off her head. So I'm going to go to the coverage slider because that's the coverage of how wide these are. So I'm just going to up this all the way so you guys can really start to see what happens here. Okay? So you see you start getting some width in this these cards now. Right, And if I want to go even wider, okay, because I've maxed out the slider, above that is a profile. And this profile will allow you to even put things wider. So right now I'm making the root bigger. Okay, and then this is the tip. See? So you can see how quickly I can start really getting this to where I need it to be. Now I can say now I've got too many. So now I can start going 0.5. Then I can say 0.1, which is 100. So now there's 100 of these meshes coming off her head. And I know that in the top here, it tells me there's 100, right? And it's telling me how, what the polygon count is. So I'm going to say 100 is obviously too low. Let's try 400. 400 is pretty good right now. Okay. So now I got 400, which is nice. Okay. Got that. Looking good there. Right, so now the next thing that I want to affect and look at is the length. Like, how long is this hair? Okay, so that's obviously the slider that's called length. I know, brain busters here now. Right, and it's just establishing now the length of her hair. Right, how much length do I want? Okay, now, you can see that the hair is kind of just like she's electric being electrocuted in a way, right? So this is important is obviously there is a gravity slider, right? Right here that will pull on it, right? And see now it's maxed out and it's kind of pulling on it. But really what becomes what one of the more important items here is not just that gravity, okay? It's more about the number of polygons I'm allowing ZBrush to have per fiber, right? So every one of these fibers, the, what do I have at 400 of these that I have coming off the head, they all only have three polygons, right? And so I would prefer a little bit more. So it's just like anything, you guys divide up in your sculpts to get, be able to get more details, right? So down here, there is a slider called profile, and then there's a slider called segments. And the segments, you can see, is set at three, and that's telling ZBrush every fiber has three polygons. It does look like Tina Turner drawn. Nice, right? Bring in the 80s, John. I love it. Bringing it back, baby. You should watch that documentary, Tina, if you haven't. It's very interesting. So this, as you can see, as I add more segments, see the hair just naturally starts to fall. It's falling because now there's more polygons 
for the gravity to pull on. So I haven't changed the gravity setting. I put it back at the default at 0.5, but you can see the hair's falling more, right? And wherever, however the head is facing, that's how this is going to work, right? So you can see how this is falling. And right now, it's also twisting a lot. So there's a twist. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna reduce the twist and then now you can see what you'll start to get. Right, and then now you can start establishing more things. Like, do you want more length in the hair? Right, stuff like this is what you're starting to look at, okay? So this would be a great quick way to uni get some uniformal quick hair cards for you to use, right? And then this can already be UV'd. So that's the other bonus to this. God, I got something in my eye, sorry. Hold on, my contact is not. I have to pull it out. Sorry, this is something in my eye. Might as well take a drink. Sorry, irritated me. Okay, so we've got these segments, but if you guys right here, there's an ability to add an image, right? So when you do this, okay, it's adding that image now to every fiber. And what's happening is every fiber sitting at all of its polygons are sitting at zero to one space, right? So this is already UV'd it now. Just by turning this texture on, we're automatically UV in. Now, if you forget to do that and you get to this point and you accept this because now you're like, ah, okay, this is interesting, all right? I hit accept. This is now going to make a new subtool, right? And now this, because I forgot to put a texture, you can actually come here in your UV mapping and there's a button right here under create called fiber UV. Because this was made from fiber mesh, it's tagged in ZBrush as a fiber mesh, right? So when you hit fiber UV, it's automatically now UV'd again. So now even in this texture map now, this is applying a texture to this, right? And so now you can do stuff like, and then of course like this, in ZBrush, pure black is automatically going to be used. Oh God, I can't, sorry. I might need to. Hold on. Sorry, I think my contact is moved in the corner of my eye. Talk amongst yourselves. Coffee talk. Coffee talk. Hold on, I might. I might need to go out in front of a mirror. Hold on, guys. I gotta go to a mirror real quick because this contact is completely loose. I'll be back in a second. I need a mirror. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll be back in a minute. So again, what I'm showing you guys is a quick way to just start establishing some hair cards for gaming, right? 
and obviously you can control the amount you want and this could be just a simple base right and there should be different size hair cards through here and now i just showed you how you can uv it right <clears throat> and then establish put a texture on it okay so now this is where we start going so obviously you put a texture on this it looks more like hair Great, you can do that. But what's also really fun about fibers, before I go one more thing with hair cards, is this. This is a nice little cool little fun thing that you can do. All right, so in geometry, if you're gonna to modify topology, I really love this about fiber mesh. This is one of my favorite things, okay? Is come down here to micro mesh. And let me put it higher up because my head's almost covering it. Click on this and it's going to open the tool palette. And now I can grab a mesh, like say this helix. And now it's telling me to turn on in rendering. Okay, so in the render menu, render properties, I need to turn on draw micro mesh. Okay, so here, let's go a little bit darker with this. Right, and you'll see there's some weirdness happening in there now. Right, see that? What's happening is this. When I go to render, okay, which is shift R in ZBrush, we actually swap out those hair cards in this case, the you know that geometry and give you the mesh and then this mesh okay stretches across it. Now I ran quickly into my house and used a mirror. Okay? So this is what's nice about the fiber meshes as well. You could do so. I do this for a couple things. It's not just for hair. I'll do this sometimes to just create stuff. Because now that's fiber mesh, it's tagged again. Because I made it from fiber mesh, this is tagged inside of ZBrush as a fiber mesh. Right? So then this is pretty cool to be able to do that. Right? So obviously, I could use this for feathers. I can make some geometry. I can do whatever I want and start. And then. This is only at render time, right? So you're not gonna be able to get this out at this stage, but it's easy to get out from ZBrush is the easiest way to do it is click this button right here. Convert BPR to Geo. So let me turn on, let me make sure you guys can see that. This button right here, convert BPR to Geo, which is in geometry. If you click this button, we then convert to the real topology. So we get rid of the hair fiber cards that we were talking about, and we now get the spirals. And then that's the real topology. Right? So this is pretty cool to be able to do stuff like this as well. So and you can turn it off and turn it on. So this is one way to go about the question that I was asked. Now, the other thing, the way you guys can go about this is you can just draw it yourself. We actually have shipped brushes for you. Okay, that are meant specifically for gaming hair cards. So there's the curve flat, and then there's the curve flat snap. Okay? So this is literally going to draw a mesh. Wait, I got to get rid of my subdivision levels. Okay? That's just plopping in SNC. So this plopping this, right? And then I can adjust and move this. So if I'm trying to make one that is coming around here to her back and it's going to go around her ears, I can do stuff like that. Now, what I probably would want to do since looking at these, I probably want it to taper a little bit. Number one. And then when I'm drawing like something like this, it is snapping completely to the surface. I probably don't want that either. And then up here at the top, I probably wanted to come off the head a little bit, right? So I want to do three things here. I want the beginning of the fiber. I want it to kind of pop off a little bit of the head, then come down, right? The second thing that I want is I want to taper on this. And the third thing that I want is I don't want this. Like our hair shouldn't be doing this. If someone has long hair, like their hair doesn't just like from this in the front, unless it's wet or something. It just doesn't stick to their face, right? And go like, it's not like a liquid that's going down their face, down their neck. It's hair. If you have long hair, it's going to fall. And then there'll be a gap in here between the neck and the hair before it hits your shoulder, the, their shoulders and falls down their bodies, right? So it shouldn't stick to their neck like this, right? There should be a little bit of some, 
you know, realism, uh, at least the way a hair should fall. So let me walk you through how to do this with, say, this brush. Let's do the first thing. Let's just first do the tapering. Okay, so I want some tapering. So I'm going to go to the stroke palette. Okay, this particular brush has curve mode turned on. So I'm going to go to the bottom one that says modifiers, and I'm just going to turn on size. That's it. I've now got a taper to this brush. Okay, and this taper, see it's happening at the start. That's not where I want it. I want it, the taper at the end. So under the stroke where this was, the curve modifiers in that size, I'm going to open that this graph right below it by clicking on it and then hit FV as in flip vertical. And then I'm gonna make the taper end not so tapered. And then now if I click this, you'll see that's what we get. So now I've got a hair card that has tapering happening at least, which is start, that's more, more realistic to a hair, especially for like maybe a, like the female that I'm doing right now, right? And you can control this. So if I don't want as much tapering, you can control that, right? It's up to you how much tapering you want. Right, so there you go. So you see what's happening though. It keeps looking at the model and doing this. So we've got a little bit of taper now. The next thing that I want to solve is when I'm drawing this, I want this portion to kind of just come off just a little bit. Not crazy, just a little bit maybe. Okay, so in the stroke palette, okay, we are using curve mode. So the menu called curve is where we activate curve mode. So this brush has this activated. So with this activated, all the other two menus below it are useful to us, right? And the one thing that I want to do now is something that's new to ZBrush is I want to come here to this repel and I'm just, uh, let's start with just two, okay? So what I'm telling ZBrush to do now is when I draw this out, okay? Kind of pop off a little bit, right? So this is now, see, popping off the surface, okay? And it's looking at what we're making and saying, okay, let's now maybe not two, let's go one, right? And then let's also, in this case, let's also maybe have a different fall off. Like, so you can have a stronger fall off or str a different type of fall off happening. And you can see it's really trying to make that pop off the surface a little bit more. So you can adjust all these settings here to do different things with this. Where this now comes in really handy is something like this, is now you guys all have the ability, right, <clears throat> to look at two things now. One of my favorite brushes is the extrude profiles, right? So this brush, if you look, it's now doing this, but it's already mat automatically. So if you're now you're a person that's trying to make hair that's more for 3D printing, this makes more sense to you, right? And you see that it's kind of popping off the head a little bit. And then what it's doing is it's looking at these shapes, these profiles, to create the profile along the stroke, even to the point where you can grab something like circles and it looks like a bunch of spaghetti. It's a spaghetti, right? And then... See, all this. So this is just flat plane geometry doing that. It's going along that. Right? So this is another idea. And if you guys want to get even simpler, okay, just grab an alpha. There you go. So this star is now being extruded along the entire curve. So I can click on this star. I can click on this. And see, now it's swapped completely different look. What does it look like with this, right? See how different that starts to look? Just with the alpha change, right? If you want something that's not so strong, you just want a circular shape, there's a circular shape. So you guys can do, this is using an alpha, and then this is using a flat plane. And it's anything, like anything. like. What I mean by fat plane is literally a plane. Like take this, okay? And then I'm gonna go with way less topology. Let's go 12 by 12. Now nah, let's even go less than that. Okay, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, let's go four by four. 
Okay, and then let's make that a mesh. Okay, and so this is a flat plane. And I'm going to actually delete that. So then that's my profile. So this plane's perfectly flat. I'm looking at it with the camera. I'll go back to this extrude profile brush that's already tapering. It's already gotten popping off going. Okay, and there's the third thing that we haven't touched yet going on. And I'm going to come here to brush and say from mesh. And then bam, I just added that to the brush. And then of course what that means is now this brush has a plus symbol being extruded along the whole thing. It's it's that simple. It's just any flat piece of geometry. It's got to be perfectly flat. Okay? And number 2, you can take any sculpt that you want. Take anything that you want, right? Even take her Let's get back to just her. Okay. I can take her and make an alpha out of it. So go to the alpha palette. Right. And then say from mesh. That'll open this up. I'm deciding what way I want to look at the alpha. I'm going to say that's good. Okay. And then now I'm going to, in the alpha palette, right above from mesh, to mesh now becomes available along with flat. So if I turn flat on and hit to mesh, I get a flat representation of her based upon the alpha. Right? And then now, of course, this brush from mesh. And you can see now that is in the brush. And then now I can do that. And I've literally using her face as like a card. Okay? So this is branching out not just gaming cards but hair like this that's more for 3d printing which will be very beneficial for you okay can come in really handy i use these all the time now for i'm doing hair for stuff that's 3d printed it just makes sense it's a quick way establish some really major hair okay it's a fun way to do it so there you go and then the other thing then that i need to get back to is what we're also doing with this when we're doing this, right? So I was talking about it's popping off the head. We've got a taper, but it's also see how this one's not connecting to her neck. So even as this, right, you can see this is not connecting to her neck compared to if I go to, let's use this time. Let's go back. Let's go back to this. And right now, let's just turn this repel off, right? If I'm doing this. Right, see how it's connecting to everything? I can actually tell ZBrush not to do this. Right, so in the picker menu, the depth is what's being used for the brush to analyze the depth. So right now this is set to continuous depth, which means as my hand keeps moving, right, the curve's gonna snap, and then when I'm moving around everything, it's continuously evaluating the surface. So I'm telling it to snap and continually evaluate and find the curvature of the face. Okay, one, once Z is just once. So see, it's going through, it's not snapping at all. There's no snap happening there, right? If I go now to closest, that's what some of these other brushes have actually turned on. So when I do this, you'll notice see the hair now falls flat here. It's not touching her neck and her cheek anymore or her mandible at all it's pretty much getting to the ear and stopping and not going any closer that's because throughout this whole curve the entire surface that it's being drawn on the closest point of interest is this part of the ear where the curves coming in line with the mesh so that's why the rest of this stays perfectly straight because nothing none of this area in here right is closer to the surface than it is right there does that make sense everybody that's what it's doing it's looking as when you're drawing this out okay it's looking at this and evaluating going okay the closest point for this curve right now is this area right here right right in here so from that point on everything must stay along that same line unless it found something that is closer to it right so if i come along this direction like this 
can see this found the cheek and then now see the rest of it. It's not snapping to her head. Right? So this is the benefit of that <clears throat> is having this ability. Because if I am doing something like this and then like this, if I want to start moving it, the other thing that I would probably do is I'd put both bends on and I would put the both lock start and end. That way I can even continue to move this and position this where I want. However I want this to even come off, if I even do want it to come off a little bit off the head, I can control all of that. And see, I can do all these controls. So locking down the start and end, I can't pull this hair off her head. Okay? So something like this. Um, your question, can I explain the plane changes of torso? Do you mean like in a human torso? Like how the plane changes are happening? I used to have, I think it's in my office, the other office. If that's what you're talking about. Uh, I don't have it here. Darn it. If that's what you're talking about. Oh, I think that... God, my eye is just irritating me today. Actually, I think the contact is stuck up here. Sorry, my eye just started bothering me again. Pretty important thing, our eyes. Okay, so there you go. Those are the settings okay, that you have for that. I think the contact it never actually came out. Okay, so <clears throat> as far as a human torso goes, the planing of a human torso, um, it comes down to just like, you know, like this, there's plain heads here. It goes back to the very beginning that we were talking about in this stream, actually. Is again some simplifying and looking at mark markers of a face, like right, and then this. Wait, this is my first live stream. On YouTube. Well, welcome, empty poke poke plays. First stream ever. Welcome. I don't know. My contacts bother me, Thomas. I don't know why. So, like this is a plain head, right? So it's things again. If you were here in the beginning of the stream, this plane is a a certain plane. That's where like this bone is, this zygomatic bone I was harping on. And then this gets flat because then it, there's a shift in plane here. So you're going to have that same kind of stuff in a torso, right? So you got to look for those plane shifts. Like if you take like this model that's already got like a body... There are certain plane shifts happening here. So let's get rid of all the layers. Okay. So what you got to start understanding is even right here, you should start seeing plane right, right here. So if I start now using something like H polish, there's a defining plane right here, right? This is making up the muscle that's going to connect here into the arm, right? The muscles are actually... It's really cool in the arm. They're they're actually like this, and then they flip on themselves like that when we move our arms, which is pretty cool, right? So there is a defining plane here. Then that means there's a plane shift here as well, right? So there needs to be an essence here to here, right? This is a point of interest then to here, right? So this is important to establish this plane that's going here to here, right? Something like, like this. Let me, I'm gonna switch to Dynamesh. So I get rid of that. Uh, oops, we need a little bit more resolution. There we go. Okay, so this is all you're starting to look for when you're planning something out. This is establishing, so you can see the muscle connects here on the arm. So that's in essence, this plane's establishing that movement and then this plane's establishing here which is establishing the base 
of our area here, which is going to transition into your rib cage, right? So then that rib cage has a plane shift right here as well, right? And this is why you would start using something like H polish if you wanted to as well. Start establishing these plane shifts that you should start having in a human body. Right, and then up here, there's a plane. Right, that's what this is all about, is that plane shifting right here, into here, into here, and then you got a plane shift here. And if you just start quickly establishing this, you'll start seeing like the chest start popping. And I think this is a great way to learn, honestly is by trying to do stuff like this, it'll make you see things that maybe you didn't see before. And it'll make things pop off for you a little bit, right? And then now you're got to establish the planing of this rib cage in here, right? So there is this area in here, right? This is a rib cage. And then this is leading into, there's a sternum muscle right here, right? That's going all the way up through here the center right and then that's where this plane in essence is fanning into here and then that's this is a high point of the rib cage right here then you got your obliques right and for us one the most important ribs is the 10th rib which is the rib way down here as an artist like okay there's 12 ribs and there's two back here but i'm i'm mr chubby right now so you can't even feel them but this rib we a lot of us can grab our rib cage if I stand up I can almost grab this rib cage in here right right in this area right here right right there that's that tenth rib so you can see this is coming down and then it starts working its way back up right it starts working its way back up and then there's a bone our sternum bone right in here which is fusing our rib cage to come together right so this is what it's all about is discovering those planed areas is really for me it's really starting to establish the bone structure in the body like that's kind of what i start and if you have to really accent it you do stuff like this right and then start plane shifting this in and then there's a bone here start establishing these planes this way and then the rib cage comes down like this right this is that one bone that's really important to us the tenth the tenth one is right there Okay, does that help? Does that answer that question for you? Okay, so th that's in essence, same thing. So I'm saying that's, you can look at the planing head and then again, I do, there is a model that, I, again, Alex from Anatomy Tools did, he did sculpts of the very simplistic planing. Then I'm going a little bit more, a little bit more advanced planing and then immediately you'll start seeing a character pop out and you can start sculpting. Okay? So hopefully that answers your question for you for that. All right? So I want to get into another question. Um, that how do I make something like vines wrap around a pole per se? Right? So the first thing, honestly, is the vines. Right, because if I a pole, that well, that's the well, that's the easy part. I can make a telephone pole. Right, you got something like this, right? And I want to start wrapping things around it, right? Well, it's going to make the most sense to create an insert mesh brush that has curve, right? On, so. I got something here. Let's give it a little bit more topology so you guys can visually see, right? So it's something like this. So there's already a brush shipped with ZBrush that has a vine, okay? So there's an IMM curve brush, okay? And at the very end of it, there are four vines. There's vine one of four, two of four, three of four, and four of four, right? So this is just going to allow us now, you know, to have a curve, and then the vine, see, it's going to be wrapping around this pole. And I probably would want this a lot bigger. 
something like this, right? And then I can just keep wrapping this any, anywhere I want, right? Because it's a curve. Right? Stuff like this. Okay? Now, what I might want to do as well is looking at Vine 1 of 4. If you look, when we start drawing this out, okay? The big thing that you guys should be noticing is the vine is actually being different. Right? So if I look at just the vine now, it's never the same thing along any of the curve. It's something different. Right? And it's because this particular mesh, vine one of four, is actually cycling through all four of the vines and randomly selecting them. So John's already throwing it up there. Yes, this is variations. So this would be number one, the first thing you should do is you should establish a brush that has various vines in it. And this particular one has four, right? And like this one's got two leaves. This one's got two leaves, but they're in a different location. This has only got one leaf. And then this has got none. Right, so, and then this brush, because I'm sitting on vine 104 in the brush palette, because I want to, I want the brush to change along the curve, i.e. the mesh, right? I want to open up my modifiers, and then you can see there's a variation sliders of four. So that's telling this mesh, I actually don't want you to just drop, 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 drop this mesh along the curve. I want you to grab this one and the three other ones. So one, two, three, four. And then the slider next to that is establishing how do you want them to cycle through these four pieces, right? So then this becomes important to me. And if I had, you know, like eight, 10, 12 of these, I could change that variation sliders to eight, 10, or 12, and then randomly. And then you would get more a realistic looking vine, okay? So this is the very first thing I would do to this question before even worrying about wrapping around the, the vines around. I would want to make an insert mesh brush like this, right? That has various pieces in it. And then if you notice, the topology is the same. That way it can match. And what this is actually using is try parts. Okay. And what I mean by that, let me pull this one off. Okay, so here's the actual mesh that's in the brush, right? And you'll notice there's one polygroup, two polygroups, three polygroups, right? And then all of them have, those sa have the same thing. They have three polygroups, right? And the only thing that's happening here is this is the end. This is the end. Dun, 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 the end of... Okay, enough. Right? This is going to be the end. This is repeating... Right? And then this is the beginning. Right? So this polygroups are what they're doing. And the thing that's repeating is this polygroup. So all three of these have this same thing set up. They have three polygroups with the beginning polygroup, middle polygroup, and end polygroup. So to do this, this is what you would want to do. Right? So if I wanted to make more of these as an example, I can say, here, let's make some more. Let's, here, let's grab some leaves. And let's copy these, let's position these, let's even shrink some of them down. Maybe not that small. All right, and then here, I'm gonna turn off perspective just so I can see this, and maybe something like that, and then maybe rotate it. It's just sitting somewhere else. Let me make another one. Now let me rotate that. Let me move this somewhere else there, right? So now this one's got more leaves, okay? So I got still three polygroups. So this is one polygroup, two, three. So this, I'm just gonna say, let's call this, we'll just, I'll keep with the naming convention. Vine, uh, let's just call this five of, let's just say I'm gonna, let's say I'd have eight total. Okay, then I go to brush, I say from mesh, and now it's been added. Right, and then I can say, all right, let's do some more of this. Okay, so let's grab this one now. 
And again, this is all stuff I'm using in ZBrush to make it easy for me to copy, paste, get copies of it, right? Holding control, clicking on the arrow makes a copy, rotating it now, rotating it, making it be very different, maybe something like that. Okay, I like that one. Now brush from mesh. Uh, I didn't change the name, but that's not relevant. Oh, welcome Devil Dog 2. Another new member. Thanks for jumping in the stream with us. Okay, so now that I have more, right? I have now six. So at this stage, I don't want to go to this brush part and say, there's not six variations. I mean, there's not four variations. I want six variations. And I want the six of those to randomly go through. So now when I draw this out, right? It's looking at the six is what it's going to look at. Okay? It's going to look at one, two, three, four, five, six, and cycle through those. That's what it's going to start. So this is how you would start making this. Okay? So this would be the first thing that you'd want to do is establish how many variations do you want. We'll go back to the original four. Right? So this one's got the four. And then now wrapping it around the pole, the curve already connects to the mesh. So you just draw on the pole and wrap around. Now, one thing do I want to emphasize, though, that you guys could do, which could be a good way to go with this, is this. Think about wrapping. Why not just grab a mesh that already is wrapping like this? Right? And I can control at this state. I can control its coverage. Right? I can control its thickness. Right? Uh, I have all these controls here to do whatever I want with with this. Right? I can make the radius not be the difference and let's make the thickness to be again back to consistency. Something like this. It's a spring! Right? So this is already spiraling for me in a way, right? <clears throat> so I got this mesh and you can come here back to this if you wanted to instead of even drawing the curve like I've been doing let's insert this thing and let's size it up and then stretch it out okay and then maybe switch to move topological go with a little bigger brush size and just start moving this around a little bit and see, move topological is going to allow me to move just different portions of this, even though it's not masked out. It's based upon topology flow. Right? So this is one way to go about doing this. Right? And I want to pull that one out. And that's going to sit like this. Right? So I'm just starting with something that already is spiraling. Spiraling out of control. Right? And then just I'm moving around and manipulating it differently, right? Now, what am I going to do with this? What I'm going to do with this is I'm actually going to get rid of the caps here. So I'm going to switch to Z model. It'll be the easiest for me. Delete flat island. Delete that. So that's gone. And let's delete that. Okay. And now bringing the pole back, what seems to be important to me is this row of topology. So I'm gonna to go to polygroup, polyloop, right? And so you can see that's going all the way around. And then let's do another one that's a completely different polygroup like this, right? Now I go back to that brush. Uh, I am in curve, we have this. I'm gonna look at only now these two polygroups, which is establishing a little bit of my spiraling that I wanted, okay? And then now go to stroke, open up functions, curve functions, turn off border, and in this case, I'm gonna turn off creasing, and now only keep polygroup, and then hit frame mesh, and what I get is a curve that's going where those polygroups are, and now all I gotta do is touch, and I'm gonna get, and we'll go bigger, the fibers repeating in that direction that I've already established sculpturally, right? So this is me using sculptural elements, right? And then now I can split off this unmasked points, right? And now I don't need this. 
And then there's the fibers. Oh, not fibers, uh, the vine. Right? So this is me just using a piece of topology to do this. Now, another way, okay? Oh, you want, you want the Lisa needs braces moment, right? The other way of maybe looking at doing this, right? It would be, how about we take this, let's append a Z-sphere. Right, so now I got a z-sphere here in space. And I'm gonna switch to move. Whoops, I picked the color. Okay, so let me just switch to a different brush. Okay, and I'm gonna switch to move and move this z-sphere somewhere in space. Let's say, let's move it right here, right? And then I'm gonna say, what do I wanna do with this? Right, well, what I wanna do is use it. So I'm going to change the size, switch to draw, and the Z spheres will automatically snap to the underlining surface. In this case, right, that underlining surface is the tube that I'm drawing on. And you're going to switch from draw and move a lot up here. Right, so move is going to allow me to move the Z sphere around if I want to move them around. Okay, and then draw, draws out more. And as long as there's a Z-sphere selected, see that's not selected anymore, switch to move, select it, and now maybe I wanna come this direction now with the vine and then this direction, rotate, switch to move. And I don't care about the size of the Z-spheres, honestly. So you can do stuff like this. Okay, and then now that I have this Z-sphere in, we have the ability in stroke to use curve helpers, right? And you can scale the Z spheres to the same draw size. So they're all the same size. Okay. And then you can hit create curve, right? So it's saying there's nothing in the memory. So I'm going to say, all right, well, I need to copy Z sphere chain and then create the curve, right? And then now I have a curve right? This curve is matching what the Z-spheres did. And then the same thing now that we've already done, just click, let's go a lot bigger. And then you're going to get those repeating shapes now, right? Along that curve. So just another way of going about it, right? So to answer that question, there you go. You can just literally draw on the surface, you can take a surface that's already got some wrapping established and then just readjust or use Z-spheres and then convert the Z-spheres into a curve. And then that's it. That's how you would do that. Okay, so that's that question. Right? Here's another question that came up. Is it possible to tile a texture in ZBrush? Yes, it is possible. It's 100% possible to do that in ZBrush, okay? So I'm just gonna grab a model that already ships with ZBrush, okay? Uh, let's go to our projects. And right here, I'm just gonna load this project because it's already got a texture on it. That's the only reason why I'm loading it. It's ready for dynamics, of course, as well. Oh, Zach, glad that could help, <clears throat> all right? so. This is all this is the person was asking. They have a texture, right? Here in this case, it's on the model. This, right? So then in the UV map space, you've got menus here that are closed by default. There's a create menu and there's an adjust menu. Okay. In the create menu at the very bottom, there's a repeat. So if I drop this, drop this down to one by one, it's just now repeating that once across the surface based upon the UVs. So this is how you do it. You just come here and say, okay, I want this eight by, I don't know, 12. Do I like that? No, maybe by 10. So you can come here and then manipulate this and see what you like. So this is how you can do this. So. That's it. It's, it's not too difficult. 
And if I want to apply this texture to the surface as paint, obviously I need to make sure I have enough polygons. So I'd want to divide up with control D. You can see in my shortcuts that we'll go to 4 million. Okay. So I'm at 4.1 million. And now this texture is visually being repeated, right? Based upon the UVing. And then now in poly paint, I say poly paint from texture, right? And then ZBrush applies the texture to the surface. And there you go. Right, so that's actually painted on there now. Right, so the texture map, see it's off. It's not even on, like I could get rid of it and it'll still be there. Okay, there you go. And that's, that's, and then you can bring any texture in that you want and then apply it to that model if you want to. Right. Obviously, too, if you're trying to maybe establish an image you want to bring in, you want to paint in this. Okay. You can even bring in an image. Let's let's use something. Here, let's use the checkers. Okay. So I can take an image even and come in here and click here. I'm using ZBrush, Martin. Is what I'm using. So see this. All right. This is an image now that's just floating where I want. Okay, and I can position this also wherever I want. And then of course, I can paint and sculpt with this. So I can paint over, right, some of the stuff that I've even already painted on this model. Right, so you see I'm starting to establish that checkered here. We should probably go from up here. Right, so this image, I can move wherever I want and then start painting with it, right? However I want this to paint. Okay, so there's this ability to do that. But the reason why I'm bringing this up, you know, let's make this bigger, is this can also be tiled. So let me, let me adjust the intensity. So let me do that. And let me up the opacity all the way. Okay, so this has the ability to be repeated as well. Okay, so that's what these are right here. So I can repeat horizontal or vertical. And if I hold the shift key, it will repeat the image. Right, so the benefit of this is, again, you can use this to paint with and sculpt with. Right, this is Spotlight, obviously, that I'm using. Well, not obvious to everybody. But this allows me to bring any images in that I want. Okay, I can bring in even textures in. So I can grab something. Let's have, let's, as an example, have a little bit of fun here. Let's grab the tree bark and then this tree bark. Right, so I got this tree bark and I've got this tree bark. And I'm going to delete the checkers now. And let's pick her face this time. Uh, and let's just look at only her face. Let's see. Uh, let's go up one more subdivision level. Just uh, maybe one more, just so we get a little bit more information. Okay, so these textures are floating. So all I have to do is put the model underneath the texture and then just apply my paintbrush, right? And then it paints. And then this is symmetrical. Okay, now this is difficult to look at because I can't see really what I'm doing with the model. So this is why it's called Spotlight. So if I hit the Z key, I go back as in Z as in Z brush. I go back into <laughs> the editing of the images mode, which we call this edit spotlight mode. And what I like to do is I like, I prefer to have the spotlight radius turn on. And this is where the name spotlight came from. It's almost like a flashlight. Okay. And so when I crank this up, like rotary phone school, school, it's creating a spotlight. So when I hit the Z key to come out of the edit mode and now I'm in projection mode, the images are still there, but I don't see them until my cursor goes over. So this is why it's called spotlight. So then I can come here and say, oh, okay, I want, yeah, that's the part of the image that I want. Something like that, right? And then in this case right now, I'm working symmetrically and, right, I'm working with two tree barks that are also, different 
Okay. So one thing that I like about this as well is if I'm doing something like this, especially in this scenario where I've got two different tree bark images, I want this to look like they, they are closer to the same tree. Like they came from the same tree in essence. All right, so this is really easy to do with the edit spotlight, okay? All I need to do is go to this hue brush where I can change the hue of the images, okay? Position this where I want. So I'm gonna say right there. The color information in that part is what's important to me. And then I'm gonna say grab the hue, right? And start saying, I want this part to be analyzed based upon where my cursor goes, right? So the texture on the right is selected and being edited. And then that portion where the is sitting, that's important to me. It's using that information plus now where my cursor is to analyze the images, right? And if I do the opposite, right? Now I wanna change this one instead. Again, it's just clicking the hue and then dragging over, and maybe I wanna do something, yeah, actually, something like that. And then now I'm gonna adjust the intensity a little bit, and then there, right? So now those images look like they belong to the same tree now, even though I don't even know if they were the same tree, right? And then now, as an artist, when I'm painting, right? So if I like what I'm painting here, and now I wanna bring in the front, I wanna bring in this part of the tree, they're gonna look like they belong together now. Okay, and of course not even just painting, but we have the ability to sculpt with it as well. Okay, so if I come over here and I start doing this, you can see it's sculpting the details of the image, right, into my model. Let me turn off symmetry. So it's not just about color. It's about painting and sculpting, and you can do both at the same time. Right, so if I turn my poly paint back on for this, when you're here, see this is sculpting and painting at the same time. I'm getting both elements all at the same time. All right, so that would be how I would go about answering this question. I'm assuming this is what the person was asking for, tiling a texture is what they were assuming. So I was assuming it was what they wanted. So there you go, that's how you do that. Okay, another question that came up is, what does the crease curve brush do? Well, this is, this is a nice brush, especially for those that do a, some hard surface. Okay, let's, let's go as an example. Let's. Let's turn off spotlight now. Let's grab, let's go simple. Okay, let's, yeah, let's just reload a new project. Okay, and then I'm going to replace this with a cube. And let's have this cube just be simple like this. Turn on dynamic, all right. And let's say, let's add some more loops to this. So I'll just mirror well down the middle. I'm gonna start just shaping this up a little bit. Maybe it does something like this. We need a little, I want more, more information than that. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, and then let's switch to Z Modeler. Let's insert an edge there. Let's insert an edge there. Okay, let's symmetrically work at moving this shape and just blocking out a little differently say something like this, and then now maybe the front of it comes down quite a bit like this. Okay, so let's say this is gonna be the start of like a spaceship, like a shuttle, right? So I'm making the shape, or like a vehicle. This is gonna be the front of the vehicle. So when you're dealing with this kind of element, the nice thing about the curve brush is going to be able to do certain things. So I'm going to take advantage of low polygons. I'm gonna make that a new poly group. It's Christmas. Let's even add some more loops like this. Okay, so I've got a poly group in the back and now I got a poly group of red everywhere else. Let's 
getting a little too pointy for me. All right, so you're gonna start sculpting on this, okay? And let's say I apply this now and I switch to the H polish brush to start. Okay, I wanna start defining a line that comes in here on this model. Like if this is gonna be hard surface, I want a defining maybe line in here that's establishing this in here, right? Okay, so that line is there and then maybe I want another one to go bigger. Another line down here at the bottom of this vehicle. Right, so this is a sculptural way of doing this. I'm gonna turn off the floor grid. Is looking at this like that, right? Trying to establish, so you can see I'm not getting the cleanest result for myself right now that I want, right? I can of course do certain things to make this more clean. Okay, what I really want is like a little bit more of what I have up here. There's a nice flow line happening up here, coming like this, coming around and same thing up here on the top. I want it something like that a little bit more at the bottom as well, okay? So this is where that brush comes into play. Again, I'm answering this question, what does the crease curve brush do? This is what it's going to do. Number one, you cannot have subdivision levels. So I'm gonna get rid of the subdivision levels. It's really not gonna be that big of a deal, okay? And then I'm gonna come in here, hold down the control shift key, as you can see in the bottom left corner. And then we're gonna to go to this crease brush that's in here, crease curve. And what this does is this. You draw out a curve, right? And what it's doing is it's slicing through the topology. This is why you can't have subdivision levels and automatically applying a crease right? So when I'm coming across like this, I don't really like even this. Okay. I kind of got where I want my line. So I'm going to say, all right, I want that line definitely to be more like right there. Okay. This line's nice. Um, let's make it come and I can tap the alt key to kind of do something like that. And then this line, let's, yeah, that looks good. And then along the top, Something like that, right? So this is adding topology in places. And see how this is kind of doing this? That's because I have perspective on. So really for what I'm trying to do, it'd be better not to have perspective on. It'd be better than boom, then I know this is going completely around the mesh. And then when I go and do something like this now, I know that's going around and giving me, see that nice result there. And then now the same thing for the top part. Let's establish that line there. And then now this again is added new topology and it's creasing, right? This brush does not work symmetrically. No. Okay, so this is now gonna give me the ability to watch this. This this is starting to give me like a hard surface shape that I'm trying to get, maybe in front of, a, like I said, in front of a vehicle, maybe there's a cockpit. I'm gonna come here to deformations, right? And then what I'm gonna do is there's a slider called polish by features, polish by groups, and polish by crisp edges. If I do polish by crisp edges, it's looking at the actual crease. And every other bit of the topology is moving to try and fit within that, right? So you can see those lines starting to be established. So I'm going to open this up and make it really strong. And you can see, you can really see your line now, right? You can really see how that's looking like on this. And then polished by, polished by features looks at creasing and the polygrouping. So wherever the polygroups are touching, that gets nice and sharp, and then the creasing gets nice and sharp, right? Okay? So what's nice about that is that crease edge allows me to put a nice line in in certain places, okay? And looking at this, I can now come to my Z-remesher and go keep creasing, 
And let's drop this down. Let's put this down to like 100. And let's remesh this. Right, let it go through the process of analyzing the surface, finding those creased edges. And when it's done, boom. I've got now new topology that's clean. Not only that, it's following now the flow that I established. And I get a polygroup for every section between the creased edges. That's huge. And now something like this, right? If you look at it like this, now I turn on dynamic, right? This has got creased edges here, right? Because of this establishment of having these creased edges, I can now play with this slider and say, let's put a crease level of two and see that automatically softens up for me. And then that is looking more what I would probably want to get going towards. Okay. Yeah, you can use the normal, what do you mean, the, the standard brush? You can use the standard brush with curves, yes. Yes, that's possible. In fact, I use it a lot for hair. There's already brushes in here that are using uh, the curve that are sculptural. Uh, uh, let me find them. I remember if we called them curve. No, like there's the curve pinch, right? So this is using a curve, and then when you pull on it, see it's pinching. So that's using the pinch brush along the curve. Uh, and then there was, but we might have moved it. Uh, the standard brush also had a version of it. But what I actually like to do is I like to use it here. I like, since you're asking, this is something I really like. I I like to use this for hair, actually, especially since I'm a guy that likes to 3D print and toys and stuff like that. So I like to use, obviously you have the clay brush. So let's, let's apply this topology. Okay, so I can build up my surface like this, right? But what I wanna do is put it along a curve, right? So I need curve mode on. So now I draw out a curve first, and when I click the curve, it's being processed along the curve. But what it's also looking at, obviously, is my Z intensity, right? Plays a role in this. Okay, what kind of intensity do I want on that? But so does the rest of the elements. Okay, so like in curve modifiers, there's an intensity setting here. And then there's a size. And it, they're using this graph. So if I don't want intensity, right, you can use these to kind of start moving around the curve, right? So right now, this is just moving the curve as a sculptural element, right? So I'll draw out a curve and see so you start dragging it. So what you want the curve to do is going to become important, right? I want to bend both. I want it to snap. Don't want it to lock, right? And then just start moving things around. So I will make like a standard brush on a curve mode, right? And do something like this and see how it's tapering a little bit. I will do that as well. I would taper it. So right now it's locking this end because I want both of these on, right? So you can start doing stuff like this and then play with your stepping as well right so it's added more steps in this case for sculpturally I would go lower more than higher right so I'll, I'll use this a lot to do some stuff like this and then boom like that and then I'll throw in now this option to size it down right so now it's not just intensity being adjusted along the curve it's the size see so you mean by hair? It's a really nice way to quickly just throw some hair and then you can hold alt and push in instead. Right? So the direction you draw your curve is going to be important because there's a start and end, right? So if I go this route, then this is going to be the bigger portion. So knowing that I would always draw this way and then this is 
sometimes how I'll like to make hair that is sculptural hair start coming into fruition. Okay, so I like to do this a lot because then you can draw a curve and then just grab it and pull on it. And then, and then I'll push it back a little bit too. So I'll do that a lot. That's handy for me. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, okay, let's see. Hi, hold on. I actually, you're new to sculpting. I want to ask someone who good at sculpting how long it took to become a pro sculptor. Took her nine years. So you're 18. Uh, you got a lot, plenty of time. Right. So, listen. Everything takes time. Um, you listen. If you go apply yourself. You either go to a maybe a good school or you come to things like this. You engage yourself with the community, and you got to do though. You got to go try and learn and stuff. So that's why the benefit of going to maybe a school where they'll push you and make you go, right? You could be up in two years. You can be working at a studio. In all honesty, right? But if you're talking about being really prolific and being really good, I say it's the old saying: ten thousand hours. Once you've got 10,000 hours in, you'll probably be able to sculpt anything you want. Honestly, at even 5,000 hours, you're going to be doing really good. And then another person chiming in. He's on, he or she's only 21. And they've only been sculpting for a little bit. It's just about putting the work in. Okay. Um, setting up the, the standard brush for this again. It's just a curve mode turned on. That's it. So all I've done is I've turned on curve mode for the standard brush. I've set this to what I want for the stepping. And I've got both bends on. And then in the modifier part, I've turned also size on, not just intensity. So the size will taper it. And the intensity is making it start really strong and then slowly taper off as well. Okay. Uh, Lincoln, I already showed how to create hair using insert mesh brushes in this stream. So I'd recommend going back and watching this stream. I talked about it for a good probably 30 minutes going through there. You're seven years old, Star? Really, Stark? Wow, that's awesome. That's so great to see that someone that young is getting going. So you're already in ZBrush, or are you in ZBrush Core, or are you in ZBrush Core Mini? See, so the person that asked, you, there's no wrong, there's even someone said they were 51 starting. There's no wrong age. It really comes down to just putting the time in. Honestly, the best way to get good is pick something to make. And for your first couple sculpts, don't try to go extreme, because you're going to get... It's going to be tough because you're trying to learn sculpting on top of learning programs, on top of learning how to work in the digital realm right so pick something simple for your first like four or five sculpts right and pick something that's easy to get a lot of reference okay so that would be what i'd also recommend for anyone starting out that's why i said like a skull is a great thing there's skull references everywhere in fact i said i was going to bring up something there's even a skull references already inside of zbrush so right here in the grids and light box, so I hit the comma, 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 key, okay, right? It's just the comma key. Right here, there is a skull reference and then there's a human plane face reference right here, right? So if you just double click on this, it's literally gonna drop in reference images for you. So if I now, let's switch to a spherical shape here. Make that a mesh. So you can see there's, there's meshes there. And as I rotate, I see the various, uh, there's the back, switch to the front. And if I do something else here, we'll make the sphere smaller. So why, because I have this loaded now, if I go to draw, this is, in essence, got images in the front back. See, there's a front and back image. There's an up down image. And there's a, and this is actually a sculpt from Maddie Spencer of a skull. So this is a great way to learn. I don't like to show this until with my students until they've actually tried sculpting something. But this fill mode, 
change it to three and now you'll be able to see through and again you need two brushes really if you're not if i'm counting this move it's three brushes you need move which is like moving your hand around and if you want to go this route to first start out just start establishing the form of this and then this is why i would start using something like dynamesh in here and again now for those that have been in this stream i like to start a little bit lower and start moving around my surface so here you go here is a way for you to do this right it's just now literally matching an image now is all you're needing to do okay nothing else so this it could be a way there you go and i'm just using move with some smoothing and then just going from position to position looking at the top now and you see what i mean by moving around a lot you gotta move around a lot right don't get married to just one view make sure you are looking at all views Right, and then moving around the surface quite a bit to establish the forms and the shapes that you would want in this skull. Okay, so there you go. This is a great way to start. And then over here, you can turn the floor off, and now you see if you've got at least this is now the correct form for a skull. Okay, and then if you want, turn your floor back on. And now I switch to something like clay build up, which is my my go-to for blocking out stuff and now you just literally start there's the orbital bones right there's your orbital bone here's your nasal passage right start standing landing these marks here's this is your zygomatic your arch or your cheekbone as we call it too comes around and meets so it should meet up here right so here's a great way see look we're already starting to establish a skull Okay, so that is something that you could do as well, especially as a beginner. I would recommend as a beginner, try sculpting a skull. Give yourself like literally 15 minutes and that's it. And then move on. 15 minutes. Try another one. Try another one. Try another one. You'll see how quick it starts coming to you after like the fifth one. Right? And even this, one other cool thing you can do with this, since this has got images on it, you guys can come here and project the image right on your mesh. So now this is literally on the mesh. Right? And then as I turn, you can see what this is going to give me for establishing stuff. All right, So that's another way where instead of just looking through the model of the image, it's actually putting the image on my model. So that looks good. That looks. And so you just move things around until the image stops showing incorrectly and then just reposition. All right, so try that as someone that's new to starting out, like you said, for yourself. This would be a great way, and I would say building a skull is a great challenge to do um, for you. So again, I'm just loading what's already shipped with ZBrush, and now I'm just copying, following Maddie Spencer's sculpt to make my own skull. Right? And anytime I turn the floor off, I'll start to see what I'm doing. Do that too. Make sure you're turning the floor off and taking a look. Okay? All right, so... I got to get going, everybody. I appreciate you all for coming through and watching this. Again, this will be up immediately available on our YouTube and our Twitch channels. Okay. Um, I've got several other streams. The last, I right so far, I've streamed the last two weeks every Friday. So there are other streams of me going through features like this. Um, the beginning of the stream, we really talked about even starting from scratch. So I thank you all for taking time today, coming with me. Watching another exciting hashtag Ask ZBrush. And again, for those who want to get me to answer your questions also in these streams, number one, show up to the stream and I'll answer as many questions as I can. Number two, put on Twitter any question that you might have and make sure you put hashtag Ask ZBrush. And that's where I'm pulling these from. Again, that's hashtag Ask ZBrush. Okay? And it's only through Twitter. So go to Twitter, put in your question and put that hashtag and I'll, I'll find it. Okay, so I appreciate you again for all watching. Again, I'm Paul Gay with Pixel Logic, and this has been another episode of a live Ask ZBrush, and I'm out.